I'm going to multiply the two matrices A and B shown here to get the product AB. Do you remember how it works? For the first row and first column position in AB, we take the elements in the first row of A, that's the 2 and the 3, and multiply them by the corresponding elements in the first column of B, that's the X and the Z. We get two products which we then add. That gives us 2x plus 3z to enter in the first row, first column position in AB. We then move over to the first row, second column. Now we use the first row of A but the second column of B. Apart from that, the procedure is identical, so we get 2y plus 3t. We then go through the analogous procedures, but now using the second row of A and the first and then the second columns of B. That gives us the second row for the product AB. I'll just write the answers in this time. 4x plus 5z and 4y plus 5t. If you're watching this maths cast, I assume this process is quite well known to you already. What I want to do here is to show you an alternative view of the process and introduce some new and what turns out to be very useful notation for this process. We start by introducing some labelling for the components of A and B. We label them according to their position in the matrix. So for example, A11 is the element in the first row and first column of A. That's the number 2. In a similar manner, the position first row, second column of A is A12. That's the number 3. And so on. I'm going to write out all 8 now. There are the 4 A's and now the 4 B's. Let's now move to the matrix AB. Let's look at its first component. That would be AB11. It's the amount 2x plus 3z. I'm going to write that expression in a way that reminds me of how it came about from the elements of A and B. So for example the 2 is A11, the x is B11, and so on. It looks like this. Notice that on the right hand side in each case the A starts with a 1 and the B finishes with a 1 while in the middle the indices run over both 1, 1 and 2, 2. We could write that using a summation symbol as follows. Notice that the 1, 1 stay intact but the summation is over the pair of indices in the middle and it runs from 1 to 2. If we can do that for AB11 1, 1, we can do it for the other components as well. Let's do AB12. What was AB12? It was 2y plus 3t. But now that can also be written in terms of the components of A and B and then changed to a sum. There's the component form and now notice that in each case the first index on the A is a 1 and the second index on the B is a 2 and in between we're summing over both 1 and 2. So there's the summed form. We can write out two more equations. I'll now do that without all the intervening steps. I think you can see how the pattern works. We want AB21 and AB22, both written as sums. So there they are, and we've just managed to get all four on the one page visible at once. But now do you realise we could have combined all four of these into a single equation? because in every case the summation is over the middle pair of indices while the outer indices are exactly those on the AB. So we could write an expression for AB IK component that is the ith row and the kth column. There's the beginning of the expression and remember that that first index I must go in the first position on the A. We fill in the A with the summed index J and then start off the B with that same index. Finally, we finish the B with the index K. I'd like you to immediately notice some properties of this equation. If an index appears once on the left, then it appears once only on the right as well. 
That's true of the I and the K. Any other indices appear that appear will always be summed over and they will appear in pairs. That's true of the J. Einstein had a stroke of genius with expressions like this. He realised that once you understood about how many of each index appears, that you could leave off the summation sign altogether. That is, I could write just A, I, J, B, J, K. In writing that, I understand that automatically, because the J is a repeated index, it must be summed over. That allowed Einstein to leave off the summation expression and save a considerable amount of writing effort and space in his calculations. It's called the Einstein summation convention. So I'll reiterate, in using this convention, we must understand that any single index that appears on one side of the equation must appear once only also on the other side. That's true for the I and K. Any other indices that appear will appear in pairs. And if they appear in pairs, we are to understand that we automatically sum them over their correct range. In this case, we're talking about two by two matrices, which have two rows and two columns, and so we sum from one to two. One beauty of this notation, though, is that it now extends to any size of matrix, so long as we are allowed to multiply the matrices. So 3 by 3 multiplied by 3 by 3. Where now, each matrix has 3 rows and 3 columns. So the summation is from 1 to 3. But, so long as we understand we're using 3 by 3 matrices, we can again leave the sum sign off, and just write the repeated index, J. A, I, J, B, J, K. The matrices we multiply don't have to be the same size, just as long as they are of a kind that we can multiply them. That is to say, the number of columns of A must equal the number of rows of B, so that we can consistently employ the summation symbol. One very important example of this is multiplying a vector by a matrix on its left. Here, for example, is a three-dimensional vector that has components VI, where I runs over 1, 2 or 3. We can write down the components of the vector multiplied by a 3 by 3 matrix A as follows. That is, with or without the summation symbol. Notice that the rules still work here. There is a single I on the left, and there is a single I on the right. The only other indices that appear are the J's, which have appeared as a pair. I will be using this notation extensively in my maths casts on the Kronecker delta, the anti-symmetric epsilon symbols and on the discussion of the vector product using the anti-symmetric epsilon symbol. I'm going to stop here though.